Hi, how are you? Um, well, Senator McGee and uh, Secretary Davey, thank you so much for sure. coming. My name is Mary Sarris. I'm the director of the North Shore Workforce Investment Board. And we are very grateful we have a grant from the Department of Transportation called JARC and Freedom, which provides transportation services to low income and disabled workers around this region. And we're very grateful to have it because most of our transportation, as you know, goes north to south, all roads leading to Boston, where there are great economic opportunities without a doubt. But the Jargon and Freedom Grant brings people east to west. So we bring people from Lynn, from Salem, from uh, along the coast, out onto Route 1, 128, and 114, where there are lots of job opportunities. So I just, first of all, I want to thank you for that grant. It's very important and it's very well used by uh, folks in our region. But I also want to just uh, remind folks to think a little bit about how can we improve <coughs> transportation from east to west across our region. So, no, I, I appreciate you raising those for two reasons. First, on the Jark and New Freedom. So Jark and New Freedom are actually federal grants, right, David? Yes, sir. He always says yes, that's why I do that. <laughs> um, and there's a real challenge. The federal government is taking a step back and is going to, I think, going to continue to step back, notwithstanding the good work that our delegation is doing on things like transportation. For the first time ever, since the interstate highway system was built in the 1950s, the federal government level funded transportation in its MAP 21, so called, in the last two and a half years, which is basically a small cut because of uh, consumer pricing. And I sense that that's going to happen in the future. So, for Jarky New Freedom, which is important for not only this area, but frankly for other parts of the state, rural and otherwise, uh, we have to find a way to continue to have that kind of gap service. And your point's also well taken on the question of um, all roads lead to Boston. I mean, we've really built a system, a highway system, and frankly a transit system here in the eastern part of the state that lead into Boston. And we're trying to think about more creative ways um, we spent some time in Burlington uh, a couple weeks ago with the governor because you know, employees are not just going into Boston and living elsewhere anymore. It's, just, it's so clear. There are other uh, employment centers that we have to be, I hear about the Cummings uh, Center frequently in Brimble Ave that we have to be thinking about, some other places uh, in Salem and Revere as an example. So no, we have to be thinking more creatively about how we move people. And that's a real challenge is we can't even do what we do today. It's so hard to even think about how we can improve some of these uh, feeder services, other services, if you will, that just don't have the hub and spoke system that we have today. Thank you. Hi, Brian Cranny, a small, small business owner, and I like you guys. You do a good job. So here comes the butt. That. Tommy, you made some money. <laughs> here comes the butt. <laughs> I've been enough of these. I know. You, you know, you made some points at our board meeting that was that really struck me and in information that. <clears throat> We borrow $500 million a year to fund the system we have now, that if we raise the gas tax a penny, it brings between 30 and $35 million a year in. And, you know, you just look at, in my business, you know, I always, when I look to grow my business, I always have a check to say, am I running on all cylinders before I grow? And, I, you know, you guys are faced with this huge issue of debt that you really kind of have to get under control first and foremost before you can look. And I know Bill, you're not a big fan of this because that might hurt Brimble Avenue, but you know I just think that that that's a, a, a big challenge. And I just you know with all the other tax issues and what's going on in government today, I would just hope. And I, when you look at your road systems, and if you're in the, in marketing, you have the most ideal marketing layout as far as trying to raise money through. And I know billboards, people probably you know they hate those or bridges up, but the investment besides just taxing people. You know, I, I run a lot of trucks, and I know Massachusetts is 29th in the, in the country with a gas tax, and it hasn't been raised in a long time. And, you know, I have a responsibility. I run trucks on the road. It costs more to run those trucks for the roads that are repaired. I have to do my fair share. If it costs $10 to ride the train, you know, I personally, you know, why am I subsidizing that? You can say, well, if I don't, there'll be more people on the roads. I get that. But the cost of the cost, and you really you know, have to first and foremost get your uh, budget in order. But I would just hope, don't just look at taxing, taxing, taxing. Look at, you know, 
what you have for marketing capabilities and, and uh, monies that could come in by using those roads that you own to create money besides just taxing. Uh, and I appreciate the, the points here. So a couple of, a couple of um, things to think about. One is on reforms, maybe I wasn't, I, I want to be very clear about things that we've done at the DOT and the T to save you money, to save us all money. So in the last three years, thanks to transportation reform, we saved over $500 million um, at the DOT in three years. That was largely due to some of the changes in the pension and the health care fund, uh, particularly for MBTA employees who probably enjoy too generous of uh, both the pension and health care. That's changed now. The so-called 23 and out. You can retire with 23 years service regardless of your age. It's pretty good. I thought it was 23 days now. That's why I started in government. I thought it was now quickly. Um, so that's changed. That has, we have cut headcount at the T. 10 years ago, there were a little more than 10 years ago, 7,000 employees of the MBTA. They're now 6,000. And they're running 20% of their service, by the way. Um, all electronic tolling. We'll eliminate 300, 350 jobs when that is done. And the tolling will be more efficient, by the way. So we are finding ways to improve our headcount, you know, realign benefits so that they're more structured to the private sector and not just in the public sector. Um, and we have more reform to do, there's no doubt about it. You know, our plan talks about, as I said, electronic tolling and a few other things that we can do internally to continue to improve our process. So it's not just to your point, going to our customers and saying we need to get a little more. But that is the reality. I mean, as you pointed out, the gas tax was last raised in 1991. That's the principal way, about $665 million that we pay for transportation services today. Uh, 21 cents today is worth about, uh, 21 cents from 1991 is worth about 12 cents today. And there isn't a cost that hasn't gone up in your business that isn't affecting my business either, whether it's concrete or steel or wages or health care. Um, so we have to certainly address it, not only for reforms, and we will continue to find ways to improve how we, uh, how we put service out in the street. Uh, but it's clear to me, it is absolutely clear to me that reform alone is not enough to do what we're, we're telling people we should be doing today and then having the conversation about what else, you know, what kinds of investments we should be, we should be making. I don't know, Jim, do anything else? I think just to follow up, and it, absolutely more efficiency, best practices, continuing to work on the reform that was passed in 09, uh, reflecting, uh, there's a lot of outside the box thinking in terms of how do we get other revenues besides uh, the taxation side. Uh, so that clearly needs to be part of the transparency, making sure that people know the dollars they're getting are going directly to uh, what we do, and then making sure we learn from past mistakes and overruns <coughs> and, and, and high costs and, and not, not doing those uh, kind of projects that have those kind of problems uh, that get created. But it, it, it is true, I think, if you look at the, the reality of it, and if you look at a number of reports, I think we talked about this, Brian, a little bit, the 07 report reflected major reforms that were needed to be implemented, which were implemented in 2009. The majority of the 18, roughly $18 billion in debt that they saw was really reflected on increasing revenues that were needed. About $2 billion were going to be saved over. We're, look, we're probably going that direction over 20 years. We're talking about a 20-year plan. Uh, and, and the reality is with the nine cents, it is about $32.8 million uh, per penny. And if you think nine cents less every year, there's hundreds of millions of dollars we don't have just because inflation has eroded our ability to do that work. Uh, and, and it's a challenge when you just pass something like that and then you anticipate it's going to be able to cover you for 20 or 25 years. That's not really the way it, it's been able to work for, for a number of reasons. So it is, it's a challenge for us. It's a, you know, I, I think it's uh, frustrating and we, we don't get elected to say, hey, let's raise taxes. But we face problems. We look at what those are and we need to make tough decisions to make sure we move the Commonwealth forward. So that 10 or 15 years from now, if we're able to address this, this challenge we face in transportation, we are going to see a better day. We are going to see a better opportunity for the Commonwealth. And nationally, we're not, you know, we're not alone. I mean, this is a national problem. You could pick a day and read about a different state that's struggling with the same problems. Texas, Utah, Wyoming, California, uh, Virginia. Uh, Virginia is really struggling right now. The governor proposed uh, eliminating the gas tax and raising the sales tax, which the sales tax in Virginia is on everything, including, including newspapers. You're taxed on everything. It's not the way in Massachusetts. Proposed uh, raising the uh, sales tax to 8.5%, I think, eliminating the gas tax. The legislature said no way. They're, they're trying to find their way through this, this challenge that they're facing with major uh, crises they face in transportation in their state. So you could go on and on and talk about the country. We haven't addressed this. And it really does impact the economy. And, and, and I recognize that. But uh, if we don't do it, uh, what are the consequences? And I think the Boston Foundation uh, laid out 
Uh, uh, they came out with a report a couple of weeks ago that the, it's called the cost of doing nothing. It tries to lay out that case uh, and how do we get there. And again, there's some really tough choices we need to make. Uh, everybody keeps that question keeps asking, what's the revenue? What are you going to do? Are you going to raise the gas tax? First, we need to make the case so that people understand the challenges uh, and, and that these challenges are real and that we really are, you know, between five, six, seven hundred million dollars away from getting to a level ground, to ground level uh, in terms of transit highway and regional transit authorities in Chapter 90. So uh, it's a real challenge for us in elective office, but hopefully we can work with all of you and work with our constituents and the businesses, business leaders in the state to recognize this is a real challenge, but it really is an opportunity for the state of Massachusetts to lead the way in, in, in addressing this issue and putting the dollars that we get or the revenues we're able to uh, build a consensus on and put it into transportation so that people know that's where the dollars are going and we're going to see that uh, opportunity for growth uh, as we move forward. It's a, it's a tough challenge and I absolutely understand we've had a lot of discussions. This isn't easy for us to say, hey, uh, just uh, you know, let's just raise the taxes and that's easy. That's not an easy answer, but doing nothing is not an easy answer either. So, address we have a question. Yeah, I, well, some of it's been answered, just drilling down a little bit on what those options are. I know the governor saw put together a proposal, maybe a brief synopsis on those, sure. income, sales, uh, corporate taxes, and then there were other options that um, were not included, but something that might be open to the legislature to take a look at, whether it's gas. What does that menu adjust <coughs> look like? That might be helpful to sure. um, stimulate some discussion about what preferences there are. Sure. Um, or, or not. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Mayor. So, um, so the administration put forward uh, our way forward plan uh, <coughs> several weeks ago, which outlined in very much detail uh, specifically the transportation plan, our 10-year pro, pro forma, what we thought we needed in order to pay for the system. The governor uh, and the administration put forward our budget about 10 days later, which talked about how we propose to pay for that and also for education improvements as well. So the proposal is to raise the income tax from 525 6.25, lower the sales tax to 4.25, um, eliminate the number of uh, deductions, uh, personal, double the personal exemption, eliminate the number of deductions, uh, and then also um, uh, in the future tap uh, the gas tax to inflation. So it basically means the gas tax would raise about a half a penny, uh, increase about a half a penny a penny a year, uh, thereabouts. Um, and then that would be enough to invest in the plan that we have put forward and as well invest in higher ed, um, in early child education and some additional basically chapter 70 funds but really targeting students who are in areas or in schools um, that are where the growing achievement of gap is, is occurring. So the bottom line is the administration is saying if we want to invest in our future, our future has to be in three areas, education, infrastructure, and innovation. That's what's going to continue to move the state forward and our plan to put forward uh, funds both education, transportation, and continue some innovation programs uh, that we've had in place that have been very successful since uh, the governor came into office in 2006. Now, um, other folks talk about uh, the gas tax as an opportunity. The governor did propose a gas tax uh, increase back in 2009. Uh, that was not um, seen as something that folks wanted to do, so that was uh, cast aside. Uh, that was a 19 cent, I think, ultimately approval. By the way, the, some of the some of the business community uh, advocated for a higher increase in the gas tax at that time. Um, there are other things that have been discussed: green fees, for example, basically charging more for uh, gas guzzling uh, vehicles, diesel vehicles, and whatnot. Um, others have. Um, I, he doesn't like that. I know, but it, it was my proposal. I'm just telling you. That's if, I could fit, <laughs> if I could fit my ass in a Prius, I don't. <laughs> Um, and uh, vehicle miles traveled uh, tax is another idea that's out there. Uh, the only state, or actually city, uh, Oregon, has been doing a little bit in that regard. We proposed in our plan to try a pilot program uh, because at the end of the day, I just want to make a commentary. Um, the gas tax, while helpful, cannot be the end-all, be-all forever. Uh, President Obama has put into place a very aggressive greenhouse gas reduction emission standard which will take place in 2023. Mm -hmm. So basically it means all of your vehicles and all new vehicles are going to be a lot more fuel efficient, which means you'll be buying less gas. All right? The gas consumption in the Commonwealth has been largely flat, largely flat, for 
the last 10 years. And if we get our plan, which is to actually improve transit and get more people out of their cars and into public transit, um, gas cannot be the funding mechanism. So just your point earlier, sir, about cross-subsidization, we spend a billion dollars in highway debt every year. And I told you, we only collect 600 million in the gas tax. If you throw in registry fees, registry fees and the gas tax about pay for highway debt. Some of it's big dig, no doubt, but other highway debt. So we're spending more money today to pay for things we bought, we built, or we already were served by. So this cross-subsidization has to occur. We basically need income tax today to pay for the system that we have. Because all the users, whether they be transit or highway users, are not paying for the services they're getting today because they're so expensive and we didn't appropriately pay for them in the past. But those are some of the ideas that are out there. Um, tolling as well, I should mention that. Um, electronic tolling will give us the ability in the future to do a couple things. One is look at tolling other roads in this state. That's something that I hear frequently from folks who use the Tobin from the Metro West, um, is that there's a lack of equity in the state. I think we agree with that. There is a lack of equity. The challenge with this is that we are not allowed to put up tolls on things like 93 or 95 because the federal government prohibits it. We need their permission to do it. Uh, but electronic tolling gives us the opportunity to do it cheaply in the future. We don't have to hire more people, keep our overheads low. And I think in the future, probably beyond my tenure, uh, we'll have the opportunity to do congestion pricing. What does that mean? It means charging more uh, during rush hour, charging less off rush hour, and encouraging people to travel um, during, uh, you know, before, say, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then uh, in between, and then not traveling between 5 and 7, but then having a choice. So. These are some things that have actually worked very effectively in places like London, et cetera. But that gives you a sense for what the short-term short -term proposal is and then what could happen long-term with some of the tools that, we, uh, uh, that we're going to put into place. Thank you. Um, Tom Philbin from Mass Municipal Association. Uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, Chairman McGee and, and, and Secretary Davey for the, on, on Chapter 90 in particular for we all know that uh, it's, it's been underfunded. We get about half of what we need. Uh, cities and towns maintain close to 90% of the roads in, in Massachusetts. Uh, but over the last two years, you've upped that amount about 50% uh, uh, to $200 million a year. This plan would up that again to $300 million a year. One of the things I'd like uh, you to talk about real briefly, because I had a stint uh, in the mayor's office for a while before for Mayor Driscoll, uh, and uh, I see uh, uh, Joe O'Keefe is here, and Joe Lumley was the city councilor, and uh, Kim was the city councilor at that time. But um, pavement management, uh, it was interesting. We would go to the council to, to approve the funding for Chapter 90. Um, but it would, it would always be an issue. And um, part of this plan is it's a 10-year plan. So we've been going year to year to the le legislature, and communities can't plan on the amount of money they're going to get. They have to do a five-year capital plan, but when you can only get money year to year and you don't know what it is, you can't plan. This plan allowed, gives a 10-year uh, bond, uh, so communities can plan 10 years out and they know what they're going to get. That's incredibly important and uh, it makes the money spent so much more wisely when you can do that. The second part of it is the pavement management that, that uh, you have put out forward that uh, you're going to put some of the Chapter 90 money up pavement management. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. So when communities uh, look to spend their money wisely and keep roads in uh, a state of good repair, how pavement management works. Just so folks know, sure. that's one of the ways to spend the money that the state provides more efficiently. Sure. Thanks. No, appreciate it. So uh, we have heard from communities loud and clear that, the again, the Chapter 90 allocation uh, has not been enough. And while we've done a great job with the legislature increasing that, I think when we came into office, it was around $100 million, maybe $125 million. It's now up to $200 million per year. Um, and we propose to increase it to $300 million and then grow by uh, consumer price index, essentially by 3% over the next 10 years. And as Tom mentioned, uh, it's been an annual occurrence. We're, by law, supposed to get letters to the mayor so they know how much they can spend. And then there's been, uh, we have to file a bill, legislature has to move it, there's a terms bill. There's a lot of process, I guess, is, is the answer. And, and so unfortunately, last year, I think by the time 
uh, we completed with our work, uh, the municipalities didn't know until August uh, what exactly they were going to get. Um, and for folks who don't know, it actually snows here, so there's no construction work that can get done in the winter. Uh, we realize that. So, a couple things. One is working with our partners in the legislature to move that more quickly, but two, to give a 10 year horizon so you can plan for your capital uh, outlay, so you know what you're going to get. But, I would also say, I think, and I've heard it from the legislature, and I know this from, from my team too, I, I think we need a, a bargain as well, which is to say we want the dollars out as quickly as possible. Um, there are some, not those in the room, but there are some municipalities, I think, that hang on to the dollars, um, and we want to make sure that that's getting out the door. Um, and I've also heard from some citizens in particular that, again, there are some cities and towns that could be more transparent about how they choose projects. Um, and so one of the ideas we have in our plan is to not only require, you know, five-year capital planning at the municipal level, so it shows exactly how and where you're going to be spending the dollars, but maybe to have a centralized database through MMA or someone else that can specifically show. I mean, again, one thing I've learned in transportation is we can't have enough transparency. Uh, that's how we got in trouble with the big dig and how we get in trouble with other projects. The more we can inform folks how we're spending their money, in a very specific fashion, I think that's when the taxpayers actually are willing to spend a little more if, if they know how it's going to be spent, where it's going to be spent, and when it's going to be spent. So, um, but, so those are some of the designs. It's really to say to the municipalities, we want to give you more money, we want to give you the tools to get the jobs done, but we want to hold you accountable too to make sure we get these projects done. Chairman, I don't know if you had any feedback. Oh, I, uh, I think you're right, and I think part of that discussion is going to be how can we make Jeff and how you work better. What, what, what makes sense, particularly when you continue to increase the money to the local cities and towns. We want to make sure those dollars are being used properly and, like you say, whether it's a plan in place. So that, that, I'm sure, will be part of the discussion when the legislature gets a chance to see some of these bills come before the committee as well as the House and Senate. But uh, I think we all recognize the real need, and I, I think I articulated this on a little bit earlier. We clearly identified that problem two years ago when the roads were in terrible shape, and I think we met with the governor at one point. For the whole group of legislators, and that was really the number one topic, how, how rough the, the roads were around Colma. The winter had really done some severe damage, and we haven't made the investments we need to make to make sure those roads can handle that kind of weather. So, thank you. Question here, we'll come back. Oh, excuse me, I think you have the mayor, and then we'll be over here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Lovely. Thank you uh, for being here. Just a few observations and probably a couple of requests for some homework for you. Ah, good. Uh, David, get ready. So the gentlemen, they also have um, a hybrid SUV, so maybe you don't, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to go in a Prius. Um, just um, a couple things. First off, Chapter 90, I think, uh, you know, an increase in Chapter 90 um, is something that people um, will see directly. It's, it's things that happen within their respective communities. And uh, you know firsthand that that's money that we use to provide our own infrastructure and, and, and tend to our own infrastructure needs within our, with, you know, within our respective municipalities. So that, that to me is a great thing and I'm, I'm hopeful that the uh, legislature will support all efforts uh, uh, to support that increase. As far as um, going forward, um, you, know, you talked about living on a credit card and um, you know, I've heard the governor say several times, you know, it's time we have an adult conversation about this. I mean, we can't keep saying that, you know, well, we don't have an appetite, you know, for new taxes. We can't, you know, we don't have an appetite. I mean, you know, I know I speak for the mayors in the room right now. I mean, we raise taxes every single year. I mean, it's probably the most regressive taxes, property taxes, that we could possibly impose. I mean, it's time that I think we all understand that you know, to live and pay, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, you've said that we need to do more outreach. We need to let people know what the state is facing. And um, I think if people know, I, you know, the same as they would as an individual thinking about, am I going to live on a credit card and just pay interest and keep paying interest and never seeing uh, the end in sight? I think maybe people would understand we need to attack the problem instead of keep pushing it down and just making it a more expensive problem. I mean, the, the amount of money we spend on interest every year is staggering. And, you know, I think most people wouldn't find that as a responsible way to spend their tax dollars. Um, 
a couple of things just, uh, and uh, I talked about this uh, a little bit in terms of getting traffic in and out of Boston and metropolitan Boston. A couple of projects that on a personal level I'm interested in, but I think it has um, uh, wide ranging impacts all the way up probably to New Hampshire. And that, the first and foremost, would be the Route 1 transportation improvement project. That would be the widening of Route 1 between Copeland Circle and Revere and Route 99 in Saugus. That is a real bottleneck and it causes major, major backup. Anybody living on the North Shore or that's ever traveled that road knows um, that, or, you know, that, that they'll be sitting in traffic for probably three hours a day, coming south in the morning and going north uh, uh, in the afternoon major, major trouble. And that project has been, um, I, I guess, in play now for as long as I can remember, certainly since I've been an elected official uh, back in 1999. So, you know, um, I'm hopeful that that can somehow find its way and move its way, you know, um, uh, uh, toward the top of the uh, improvement plan. Um, the other one uh, that we have talked about in the past, but because, of, you know, it's part of um, what could be uh, a casino uh, plan with Suffolk Downs would be uh, access from Route 16 directly onto Route 1. Uh, I think that would uh, also um, you know, be very, very helpful uh, uh, as well to uh, move traffic along, getting from the Boston area Who's uh, paying up that? to the North Shore. <laughs> well, I'm hopeful that it's not going to be either one of us. Good, excellent, excellent. Write <laughs> that down. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why I say that's kind of secondary. But obviously, the Route One uh, uh, widening project is extremely important. I think to really uh, many of our communities, certainly all the communities that are represented here. So, just wanted to mention that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Secretary. I'd like to make a point on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the key to this is. And I say this wherever I go in Commonwealth. Everybody understands the local impact of, of uh, a lack of investment in transportation. Uh, the, the great opportunities of Triple Ave, the expansion of Cummings Center, and what that means. The, the uh, city, city of Salem and how tough it is, City of Lynn, how tough it is to get in and out of those communities. How do you grow your economy when you can't get people in and out of the uh, Copeland Circle, 128 and 93? Uh, the interchanges all over the one, not just Copeland Circle, I mean, Walnut Street, and you go run the list, they're all some of the worst intersections in the Commonwealth. We can go all around the Commonwealth and pick those projects out locally. And, and the reality is, is once we look at a statewide comprehensive plan to get our hands around the larger crisis, and similarly with your own business and you're driving trucks around and sitting in traffic all day because the, the roads are jammed because we haven't been able to invest, you're losing money. So uh, taking that local perspective and recognizing that we can only resolve this by taking a real comprehensive statewide uh, approach and, and look at a plan that really addresses the state and looks at you know, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we, we, we need to get to a level playing field. And then we can start to address some of these projects and get them done. Uh, but it's taking that local perspective and realizing it really is linked to a statewide plan. And it's really hard sometimes when you're a local legislator and, you know, we've been talking, and we've talked to the Secretary about this, we've been talking about the Blue Line for Lynn since 1946. <coughs> well, maybe before that, I've seen plans from, plans from 1946. We recognize those things, but unless we look at it in, in, in a more... I guess global approach around the Commonwealth to recognize that we're in this together and we need to find a fair way to get the revenue, but just as importantly a fair way to distribute the dollars, make sure that we impact the Commonwealth at large in, in a good way. It comes from understanding our local needs and realizing it really is linked to the to uh, us as a as a legislature and an administration and the Commonwealth to come together to, to find these solutions and really move the Commonwealth forward. Because if we are able to do that, we will be ahead of the curve nationally. I mean, the one thing is, is in Massachusetts, we are a small state. We're only 130 miles to the border. If we could really get our hands around this and start to look at expanding service out to Springfield and seeing a huge economic opportunity and growth in Chicopee, Springfield, Holyoke area, and see some of those things, not just Boston-centric, we will be way ahead of the curve and we'll be able to do, thing, uh, do things in this state that's going to create opportunity for everyone. And it, 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 it needs to be starting at the local level, but really thinking more broadly that you can't just do the local stuff if we don't get our hands around the statewide problem. So, other, co other questions in the back, and then we'll come here. Um, uh, yes, uh, Sarah Garcia from the city of Boston. I'm the mayor of the city, and uh, thank you for being here, uh, Senator McGee mm -hmm. and Secretary Davey, and speaking with us. Um, I think any of us on the North Shore have seen 
the benefit of the recent investment on 128 and what a difference it's made. So it's really gratifying to see you taking a comprehensive approach to investing across the Commonwealth because we know the needs and they need to be addressed. Um, when we, we recently launched the Ports Compact, which includes the um, city of Gloucester and the city of Salem and New Bedford and Fall River along with Boston, and we appreciate that from the Department of Transportation as we do our economic development work in the port, we really see it's a regional um, need that we're tapping into, that Massachusetts are some of the smartest people in the world here and some of the most advanced manufacturing that's happening is what's being used offshore for a lot of the new developments. And that we really have um, almost not just a national but a global position in um, cutting edge research and devices being built offshore. And that kind of instrumentation and robotics is all built regionally. So the ports can really, when we look at infrastructure in the ports, we're looking under your new uh, ports compact and the study that you'll be doing over the next six months to look at how we can be a regional resource, what things we need to put in place so that when in Needham they're building the robotics, we're getting them out on the water for you. So those jobs are coming here and that the conferences and the regional um, uh, races and things like that are happening. No, I, I appreciate you raising that, and that's just another example of rather than just spending money, we've got the five ports uh, to really think about the port of Massachusetts as a concept and not the four or five that are competing with one another, so Fall River, New Bedford, Gloucester, Salem, and the port of Boston. Uh, what can we do among the five of us to leverage the strengths that we have? What kind of capital asset needs are there? I mean, ports, you talk about expensive infrastructure. I can't think of anything else more expensive, frankly than port infrastructure. And I think part of this impetus is we know the municipalities can't do it alone. So the state has to be involved. So, But strategic is the other point. So um, under David's leadership, uh, Senator McGee is on the Ports Compact, Chairman Strauss as well. The mayors, the respective mayors of the five cities or the designees, really thinking more strategically, not competitively, but strategically about how we invest. We're doing the same with ferries as well. Again, thanks to the mayor's leadership and Chairman McGee's leadership, so we're not just having a splotchy service, but we're actually integrated and coordinated. The T-run service, the city-run service, Lynn is going to have service in the future, Winthrop service. I mean, there are lots of, we have to make sure that we're working together in that regard. So, um, so not, not always does it require dollars. Sometimes it just requires sitting down and thinking strategically about how you're using the assets you have. So thank you for that. We're very excited about it. We think there's a lot of opportunity. I think the opportunity as well with, uh, uh, I, I was not a big, uh, I wasn't that familiar with the freight op uh, opportunities in Massachusetts, but a big a couple hundred million dollar investment that's going to really make Worcester kind of a freight center, uh, allow us to bring double decked freight trains into Massachusetts, which we're again ahead of the curve on. Down in the Bedford, there's, um, there's discussions going on with the port in Mexico where they're going to be able to hopefully start to ship between Mexico and the Bedford at $1,000 of uh, container savings. Uh, with the with the rail line in New Bedford actually right at the at the pier. I mean, there's opportunities here beyond just uh, you know the train to land or uh, ferries or whatever. So it really is when you're talking a comprehensive plan, all of those pieces come into you know what opportunities are here in the Commonwealth. And uh, we're doing a great. It's great. We just started the compact on the ferry operation, and we're hopeful and, and the communities beyond the five ports. Uh, and even the communities that aren't on the compact, we're asking everybody that's interested in water and transport opportunities, <coughs> as well as uh, seeing these kind of this potential, to come and be a part of the uh, the uh, the meetings as we move forward. So I know that's all the questions. I'll try and go as they've been asked. Well, we've obviously got a, a real problem. We've got to take some tough medicine. And I guess the real question is, how do we get the Senate and the House to vote? Make these tough votes. I'd like to make two points. First. <laughs> first at the local level, now I've been at this for 18 years, and every one of those years, the condition of our roads in Beverly has gotten worse. We've put in a road surface rating system to measure the condition of every road, and we've generously allowed ourselves a 70 on a scale of 100, which would be perfect roads. Unless we put in a million and a half dollars a year, at the end of that year, the roads are worse than they were at the beginning. This proposal to raise the chapter now from 200 million to 300 million would give us another half million dollars a year. And for the first time, we'd have the opportunity at the end of a year to have the roads be a little bit better than they were at the beginning of the year. So I think that that local argument should have appeal to every senator and every rep across the state. 
There are lots of good arguments here. Another one is that when you don't fix these things, they get worse, not arithmetically, but geometrically. And that means that you have to fix them one day, but it costs a whole hell of a lot more to fix them. So sanity would say, let's fix it now. And you know, when it gets tough, and I know it will talk, now is our chance to finally fix a problem, which aside from gun control is probably the biggest problem we've got. Just to follow up here on that, it's, it, how do we build the support? It's, it's by uh, people within the communities that my, my colleagues serve in, voice these opinions and let them know that they're supportive of the effort to make this, to make to move this, uh, try and face this challenge together. I mean, I've, I've made some tough decisions and tough votes a couple of years ago. It's not easy to do when there's, uh, there's parts of the state that, uh, or there's legislators that are feeling pressure that we shouldn't do it right now, that it's not a good time, that people are struggling. I think. My perspective is we, we really can't put it off any longer because, as you uh, identified, we'll be paying way more money. If we continue to say we can't afford it now, we really can't afford it later. But it means that local leaders, local business leaders, and citizens hopefully understand the problem and talk to their local elected legislators and say we, we hope you can find a fair way to solve this problem. That's, and that support is, that would be very helpful. No, 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 thank you. Uh, Rick Wood from a uh, um, member of the Chamber of Commerce in Lynn and a business owner in Lynn and a resident of Lynn. And I have a lot of concerns. Uh, you guys make a great case. It seems like everyone is generally for the tax increases. But um, it, I, I look at some longer trends and um, I, I see that, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I think we used to have 14 members of Congress in Massachusetts. And, and that represents, now we have 10, I believe. And so that represents an exit from the state. And I see uh, nationwide trends where, where states that don't have an income tax, they are the states that are growing. So I, I guess maybe that could kind of correct the problem because we'll have less people and less pressure on the roads. I don't know, but I, I just uh, <laughs> really, really kind of question uh, the wisdom of raising taxes. I think Tommy just hit the nail on the head. I think we're going through a very difficult time. And I believe personally as a business owner that you can't do things that you can't fund yourself. And, and, and I don't think that taxing is the way to fund things. I just don't. It's going gonna, it's gonna to increase the burden on the middle class, really, which, you know, is the, we, the, the expression is they're getting hammered. And this is going to hammer the middle class. This is going to do nothing for me. I mean, if you talk about improving roads, like my street particularly is just one huge pothole. And I understand there's no money to fix things. But uh, when I think of the, the transit system, and I see, you know, I, I question how do we get to this position where we are so far in debt? I know what, you know, how did that happen? Because we've been telling you for three decades that you can have it all and pay nothing. Yeah. At the state and federal level. But I why mean, do we build things and we keep that we couldn't afford to build? I mean, I see all these new T stations all over the place, and now I hear the bridges are falling apart. Why weren't we fixing bridges instead of building fancy new tea stations? I, I, don't, I don't get it. And uh, you know, another thing that comes to mind in statistic is I hear that it costs 10 times per mile of road uh, to service and maintain a mile of highway or road in Massachusetts than it does in New Hampshire. How, how are they doing that? $600,000 per mile of road in Massachusetts, $60,000 per mile of road in New Hampshire. Take out the debt. So, Take out the debt. Take okay, out the well, debt. So that goes back to the management that led us to this position. Yes. And now I'd like to know what, what part of our debt is uh, related to our pension system. How much of the pension service is part of the debt? Because I just None. think that the public pension system is really destroying our society yeah. very slowly. I, I'll, I'd like to answer that, and that's, that's yeah, a good question for a different area. Yeah. That, that, is, that is not the debt we're talking about. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the debt. The pension system is separate and, and, and currently... Well, so the pension debt to the, to the T the, employees and the MTA, that, that's not that, part of the no, idea? The, the, pension, the, the T employee pension no. was fully funded. Uh, and that's been changed. So that was actually fully funded. It was a separate system. They had actually paid into it. The concern was that people could go out at 23 years and go out and that that was a burden on it. But that system had been fully funded. Okay, so maybe not the T, but just in general. And, and it, it's weakened our government, so the point we have to keep raising that taxes is, on people that aren't getting anything that, out of that pension system. That, I, I appreciate that. That's a separate issue from what we're talking about. The debt that we're talking about on transportation <coughs> is not related at all to any kind of pension issues that we could have a discussion on pensions at another time. That is not what we're talking but about. But overall, here. it increases the state uh, 
what lack of funding because we're we're paying a, a, a pension system that it's, it's just not just really. Well, I, I think yeah, it's another discussion. I, I, I'd be happy to have that discussion with you, and I, I have yeah. a difference of opinion on that. I mean, the current employees today, we've made a lot of changes on pensions. Current employees today will put, pay over ninety percent of their pension costs when they retire. They will pay closer to ninety-five percent in terms of the, if they don't pay for Social Security. The state does not have to. Uh, pay six and a quarter percent for those employees for Social Security. If we went to a Social Security system, we'd be paying about a half a billion dollars more in terms of our investment. But people for on our Social employees. Security only end up with like a quarter of what people on the But they also have employees. other kinds of, of pension, and they don't contribute as the Commonwealth. The, the employees in the Commonwealth contribute 11 percent of their pension. I, I mean, I'd be happy to have that yeah. discussion with you. But in terms of the transportation piece and the debt, uh, we can talk about the, the pension issues. That is not what is causing the problem. The debt is not based on anything to do with the pensions. The MBTA employees were fully funded their pension, but that pension has been reformed. They they have to, you know, have, they can't go out at 23 years and out anymore. Their health insurance costs were substantially increased, so that they pay for the health insurance costs. The retirees at the MBTA who had retired, uh, anticipating they would have full health insurance when they retired, that was what they had worked under. Those those uh, retirees have been asked to pay for their health insurance, and so so there's been major changes that directly impact the employees across the system. But again, the pension costs were not, uh, are not part of the debt that we're talking about, the Commonwealth is facing, related to transportation. If I fired every MBTA employee today, all of them, would still, would we spend more on debt service to the payroll costs? And that's just the reality. So I sympathize with your point that you feel like maybe you're getting squeezed. I think the challenge, sir, is that for too long, we've been told we can have it all and pay nothing. We fought two wars and cut taxes and expanded benefits in the United States at the federal level. At the federal level, we cut taxes, absolutely. The federal level cut taxes, fought two wars, expanded benefits. I mean, I'm not federal. But that just doesn't add up. And by the way, all parties are responsible for that. At the state level, as I mentioned, I think the pay for tax cuts in the 1990s, we've been paying off the credit card to pay for our highway operations. I mean, that's the reality. Now, reforms are important, to your point. We need to make, make sure that benefits are realigned to what the, the private sector has. I agree with that. Absolutely. We can probably do a little more with T-pensions, and we actually suggested that in our proposal. But if I stop paying with a T-pension next year, $70 million a year, I mean, it, it's just, it's not, it, so if we want to even be arguably unfair to those folks who have worked hard for a pension, you can talk about whether or not it's too generous or not. I agree with that. We get to have that discussion. But this isn't where the low-hanging fruit is. Fundamentally, for the last two decades in this state, we've been paying for things we already bought, we didn't appropriately finance the big dig and other things, and we're still living with that today. That is the fundamental challenge in transportation. So, no, it's a fair question. Um, I think you're, you're, you know, the comparison to Hampshire, I'm happy to get your statistics. They throw in our debt. Uh, so we spend a billion dollars a year on highway debt. New Hampshire doesn't have that. I think they have one main road, 93. Um, so, and they have and they have enormous property tax, right? They don't have income tax, but they have an enormous property tax. So, uh, there was a story in the Herald, uh, is anyone from the Herald? A couple weeks ago, complaining about corporate taxes in, in Massachusetts, but they only picked one tax. They picked corporate income tax. If you amalgam all the taxes that business owners pay, property tax, gas tax, income tax, sales tax, we're actually in the middle of the pack from a business burden perspective. So. Um, Again, and you can say, well, maybe we should be lower. That's okay, but I think it's important at least to have the facts of when we have the debate. But what, we can get you some information on New Hampshire. People love to compare us to Texas and Miami. I remind them, or Florida, that they actually don't plow, for example, roads. <laughs> so, you, and, and I appreciate you comparing us to New Hampshire. That is a better state to compare us to. Uh, but when people compare me to Florida, I kind of roll my eyes. It's just not a good comparison. So. But, no, appreciate your question. And just one point on that, too, is if you had a chance to look at the other states in terms of their transportation across their state taxes, they're about $15, $15 billion in the hole. They're trying to find a way to pay for it. Uh, you know, they're, they're kind of held up because everyone's going to Texas. It's a great opportunity there. They are not spending the dollars they need to spend to keep their transportation system vibrant. And if in Florida, in terms of the tax revenue, they don't have income tax, but they have property tax through the roof and, and, and as well as uh, sales tax and other things. And if you look at the tax burden, we're in a very similar place as, as Florida is, even though they don't have an income tax. So, but if, again, I said it earlier, if you're looking at transportation and you're looking around the country, 
uh, everybody is facing the same challenge. So to, to kind of take a look at, our debt is higher than others, but others haven't raised their gas tax since the 80s. Uh, others are, uh, the system is in much worse shape because they haven't invested in an uh, advanced road and bridge project. So we are not this, you know, outlier that all of a sudden, you know, everybody looks at Massachusetts and says, oh, their system's in terrible shape. And I read the stories every day. Every single state is struggling with this and facing huge problems with their transportation systems. And they're struggling to figure out how are they going to grow their economies if they can't make the investments there. So uh, the debt is a piece of it. But the larger thing is that nobody in this country has really invested in transportation. And the federal government has stepped back for years. So we haven't kept up to what we need to do. And, and, and that's the real challenge. And, uh, and again, we, we can make a choice to do nothing. I mean, there are choices to be made. We can do something or we can do nothing. And, and so that is, that is part of the discussion as well. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll work on that, recognizing that these are not easy choices. And uh, uh, you know, I pay the taxes as well and, and that everyone else does. And uh, it's, it, it is really a challenge uh, to try and do what's right, recognizing that it's not, it's not easy and people may not agree with what we're trying to do. Uh, and I, I know there's some more questions. We'll go through it. And I, I don't know if we want to have a, a discussion on what, what makes sense. Do people think we should be trying to invest in this? Or are there ways that make more sense? I do, I do want to say, uh, Secretary, that uh, there was a whole list of things being put together by several different groups that outline what's going on around the country. And you've you've uh, talked about some of them, but it's sales tax, it's payroll tax, vehicle miles traveled, uh, open road tolling, uh, uh, you know, having the sales tax actually be pay the sales tax on gas instead mm -hmm. of the gas tax. I mean, there are all kinds of ideas that other states are, 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 are proposing. And the more that you look at those, uh, it's not that any of the ideas that we're talking about are outside the box. It's almost like part of what discussion is going on nationally, I guess. So, Gary. I, I have a question. I, I'm not invited to many social gatherings anymore as I engage in some of these discussions. Be careful. <laughs> well, what I find, and I've listened to Secretary Davey and yourself, Senator, is aren't, aren't you asking people to take uh, trust in government? Now, are the funds that, whether it's gas tax or toll, open road tolling, are these dedicated funds? I think it's, it's a question of I'm confronted with the front page picture of a, a toll collector asleep in a booth. And it, if I'm going to pay a tax, be it a gas tax, is it going to go to transportation? I actually ask some people to take a leap of faith and not a leap of faith, but trust in government to spend the money as you say you're going to do it. Absolutely. I think this is a trust in government argument at its core. And I acknowledge it earlier because transportation has for too long suffered under the lack of transparency, the big, big culture, et cetera. Um, I get that. Um, I get that. But we've tried to really turn that transparency on its head. So whether it's putting our books online, opening our doors literally to let people see what we're doing, publishing on a weekly basis all of our highway maintenance activities so folks know, and then talking about this, the track record we have on delivering in the recent period on time on budget projects and then drilling down as to why they're not on time. The number one reason why a bridge project is not on time in this state is because utilities won't move their poles. It's number one reason, 35% of all of our, and we've got legislation, the mayors probably get that because they, they, they deal with this too at the local level. Um, and we, we proposed some legislation last year, I think, and the chairman's been very helpful too, a way to, to fix that, right? So let's not whine about the problems, let's find out what they are and then address them. I just had a, a, a team uh, pro bono, I love the word pro bono, do an internal review of uh, my highway processes to see where else we could cut down. You know, we've sort of plateaued. We've done great the last few years of bringing down our notice to proceed, which is basically, folks probably know, the time we get a contract out to the time we award. And we kind of plateaued, and I want to kind of bring it down to the next level. So there are ways that we can do that. But it is fundamentally a trusted government argument, absolutely, which is why we've been so transparent about what folks are going to see. More chapter $90. Here's the list of the project right here. They're online, they'll be online very soon, so that the taxpayers can hold me accountable, my successors accountable, <coughs> to say, all right, where is this? Washington State, about nine years ago, nine years ago, I think, you know, was it nine years? Sure, it's nine years now, I said. Uh, proposed, and of course, the Western states generally raise taxes by referendum, not by legislative vote. Washington State proposed to raise their gas tax, I think, by about 10 cents 
for a short period of time, about seven, eight years, and said to the public, here are the list of 47 things we're going to do with it. And then it will hold us accountable to that. The public passed it by a small margin. Seven, eight years later, when the tax was set to sunset, folks came back out, Washington government said, you know what, we want to keep it in place. And all those 47 projects, they're either done or they're just about to be done. And then it was passed overwhelmingly by the public because they had faith that government could actually accomplish the project. I totally agree with you. This is a trust in government argument. 